Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Dr. Connie Blomgren, and I'm from Athabasca University in Alberta, Canada. And uh, I come from what's considered um, all, of El all of Canada. Uh, we've been going through a process of what's called the truth and reconciliation process of recognizing that we are indigenous uh, territory throughout Canada and that we like to recognize that territory as being where we come from. And so I live in the southern part of Alberta because Athabasca is a distributed workforce. And uh, what's interesting about Athabasca is because we are an open university and online and distance edge pr uh, provider, we acknowledge all of uh, what we consider Canada to be part of our uh, Indigenous peoples and the Inuit and the Métis. So I, I, what I'm trying to say here is that geography is often very important in how we identify. And uh, earlier when Christina had her list of I think there are eight different ways of, I, I, of identity. Um, geography was not listed there. So I think that sometimes, uh, even with that kind of list, we can still miss out some things. So um, just recognizing that. Uh, I have two collaborators, uh, Eric Christensen and Rosemarie Clam, who could not join us today. As you can see here, um, we have this question, how do you keep an OER, OEP conversation going when you have very little money? Well, in fact, no money anymore. Um, we have very little time because, of course, all professional people are very busy, all the, always looking at different ways of trying to get our jobs done. And sometimes institutional support for OER and OEP can kind of rise and fall depending upon um, many, many things that are beyond our control. And in Alberta, we have this uh, challenge of being physically dispersed um, because our higher education institutes are spread throughout the province, and you can see here uh, the black line is the province of Alberta. And then in 2014-15, uh, there was funding through the provincial government for OER development at higher ed, and those are the um, red pins that you see. So how can people from these different institutes continue to have conversations? And uh, it's very challenging. So what, what could we do? So a group of us got together and thought perhaps maybe Twitter might be a place where we could have uh, a monthly Twitter chat, but we also married it with this idea of what they call a journal club. Journal clubs were very prop popular even before uh, the internet. Excuse me, especially in the area of uh, medicine, when you would have doctors sharing ideas about their latest research. So how can you get together people to talk about research, to talk about issues, to talk about ideas when you have no money, no time, and a dispersed group of people? So Twitter was our answer. So it's on the first Tuesday of each month, and we like to advertise in advance. We have guest facilitators, and they select a open access journal article, research-based usually, but also perhaps sometimes a good blog uh, posting, discussing about um, open issues, etc. <coughs> we advertise the link to the uh, journal article about two weeks before the actual Twitter chat, and then um, the questions as well. Now this has evolved over time. It's essentially a low-risk activity, and uh, people can participate either in real time or because of the nature of Twitter, there's sort of a long tail. So like one to two days later, you're still seeing people retweeting, liking, etc. Accessibility is improving with uh, Twitter. They have a new feature there. Uh, the consistent date and time is useful for people to just kind of remember. It's about continuous learning for people who are very busy. And sometimes, you know, it's like here today, we're all interested to talk about our research, our ideas, but then you go home and you just get back to your lives. So this is an opportunity to sort of have some interesting discussions. Um, our recommendation is to keep uh, your tweets simple, to tag each other or tag um, organizations, ideas, and sometimes a little humor doesn't hurt. <coughs> of course, we're tying into all sorts of networks here. So whose networks? Well, it's the nature of networks. So it could be many people's, um, individual, institutional, etc. 
And so um, we have found that we've had lots of different uptake by different people in different places for various reasons. Here are some of our most current metrics. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we only have a small number of participants at, uh, live tweeting at the same time, it seems. But it varies on the topic. It depends on uh, who's uh, facilitating and who they sort of draw in. We've had 11 actual conversations, so on 11 different months. Um, we don't, uh, over the summer months, July and August, we just feel that people are probably on holidays. And generally, you know, uh, 50 to 80 tweets per conversation. Of course, participants primarily from Canada and people interested in what's happening in Canadian higher ed. <coughs> Excuse me. People from the GoGN uh, network have been very active. And here you can see our website metrics with just this idea of um, the views and visitors. And the most popular um, had um, 40 downloads from the website where we archive our materials um, of using Wakelet. Um, so we have challenges, large and small, of course. How do we continue to sort of you know, involve people, finding facilitators? It's dynamic, it's organic, a community of practice. But it is this op opportunity to have some scholarly discussion of our different practices in an open space. And here's our contact information. And if anyone is interested to either follow us on Twitter or um, volunteer to be a facilitator or just join us for one of our conversations, you're always, always invited. And uh, it's always fascinating to just hear the different perspectives. Probably our best uh, Twitter chat was uh, the one that was uh, facilitated by a student at Mount Royal University. It really caught up a lot of activity from students and that student perspective. So um, you never know what you're going to have with this kind of an endeavor, but I do encourage you to think about how you can either take this model and use it for yourselves or to join us. Uh, thank you so much. Hi, sorry, did you say, um, d does the uh, facilitator choose the article? How do you pick? Yes, um, between the three of us, usually I'm the one who um, tries to figure out who's going to be the facilitator one or two months in advance, ask them in advance, select something. You know, it's your choice. So we've had um, journal articles, blog posts. In February, we're going to have an entire book, which we haven't had before, so that would be new. And uh, then that person is responsible for creating five, six questions. And um, Eric and myself and Rosemary uh, will um, uh, help tweet out those questions. We kind of introduce ourselves at the beginning, just in case you never know who's showing up the first time. And just sort of say, we'll be online for about the next hour. And he here's the bit.ly if you want to go um, take a look at the questions. But the idea is that we advertise in advance, usually around two weeks. And so that allows people to maybe go and read the article, which is our real hope and desire, <laughs> that you're going to read it and come to the Twitter chat prepared. Um, and some people very much do. And so it's all over the map, right? You can't say. It's consistent one way or the other. Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Anna Moro Santos, and um, I am the coordinator at our uh, MOOC technical platform, and uh, we uh, work there with online courses. And with me, it's Alexander. She's an instructional designer there and uh, also a pedagogic coordinator. Um, we have a little agenda. So first of all, I will give you uh, some context for our MOOCs and for our uh, flipped class strategies. And uh, how do we do, we do some collected uh, data and measure the experiment, and then some preliminary <laughs> results, and, uh, and then some final considerations. It's, it's, uh, scrolling. Okay, sorry for the 
scrolling, but okay. So first of all, for the MOOCs, uh, we have the um, three types. We have three types of MOOCs, and um, it's the bridging ones, and uh, so, oh, first of all, <laughs> sorry, for the, we have, uh, so three years ago, we launched our platform, and uh, our assumptions were that anyone, anywhere in the world, uh, can access uh, to them, so they the, uh, si they can sign freely uh, on the MOOCs, and uh, they are uh, produced uh, at at home at Technical Lisboa. It's an engineering school, so our our subjects are uh, from these uh, STEM uh, topics, mainly uh, engineering, maths, physics. Now about the, t the types of MOOCs. So we uh, identified and classified these three types of MOOCs. So we have the bridging courses uh, for bi basic sciences, so maths, like uh, Dominic told you, t talked uh, just a while. Uh, it was a, an example of such a, a bridging course. And then we have our graduate courses. Uh, they are more based on our curriculum and then uh, some of the MOOCs are extracurriculum, uh, I mean some like digital uh, strategies and things like that are more for the huge public. So the, our target not so for so, uh, so for specialists, let's say. So here I would like to focus on the middle, so a graduate course. Uh, and um, I use a, a graduate course on uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors for first year students. Maybe some of you are not very familiar with the, the topic, but, um, uh, but it's a very important uh, topic within the linear algebra curriculum. So the traditional classroom, maybe you know, uh, it's more, uh, it's a situation where the group, uh, it's, uh, ex so the students are exposed to the contents in group, in a large auditorium like this one, and uh, then alone at home is supposed to make sense of the contents. And uh, we have these flip, uh, flipped classroom strategies that I use in, uh, in particular, and the, the, we try to flip the situation, so the students uh, can see the videos and the contents, the PDFs and the, uh, at home or in the train or elsewhere and came to the campus. So on campus they have in a group a discussion between uh, peers and with the teacher. So this is the flipping. The aim of our study is to, so we applied uh, the flipping uh, the flipping class strategies already for three years. In the in the this semester, fall semester, we have our third uh, experiment, and our questions are: Is it working? How to evaluate it? Can we improve it? And uh, we found some answers, and not for all the questions. So, uh, how do we measure the experiment? experiment. So the first two years we had this post-course questionnaires. We also conduct some uh, interviews for groups of students and then we compare uh, final grades. Then uh, this semester we decided that this was not enough and uh, we introduced initial and periodic surveys about self-confidence. Are they confident when they have some assessment, some quiz, some test? And uh, we had also external observations uh, for engagement. So someone external to my class uh, with a protocol uh, watches the audience and the professor, of course, even if it's a lecture. And of course, during the flipped classroom, we have also the analytics that helps to measure the engagement uh, online. Then some, uh, well, I will, the results are more or less like uh, classification. So we found uh, four types of obstacles. The first two are at uh, the starting point, so some institutional resistance. So the, the Department of Mathematics was not very fond of the experiment, but then they said, okay, go. 
And uh, of course, we, we uh, try to construct, to produce, and design a MOOC that is uh, at the same time aligned, aligned with the curriculum, but can be uh, followed by external participants. Then we have these situational constraints that during the flipped uh, classroom there is no, no sense of the students uh, sitting like that and I'm here on the stage and uh, make sense of the things. So we have this uh, question to solve and uh, of course we have also this psychological factor that uh, higher, uh, stu higher school students are very likely uh, to like passive classroom experience, experiences because they are used to. So our, our uh, high school, it's a little, uh, how to say, old school. old school. It's old school. So some uh, undertaken uh, strategies already for this semester. So we move to, the, to a very special, special room. It's a small room for 40, small, well, uh, 40, it's uh, with a capacity for 40 uh, students. The walls, we, they can uh, write on the walls and they can discuss first uh, around the table the exercises, the theoretical, the definitions, theorems, everything. Then I, I am there uh, belong, uh, among them and we, they can also put questions to me directly. And uh, I also organized with a colleague an e escape uh, game with the linear algebra uh, challenges. So they prepare for a written test with this uh, es escape game uh, uh, experience in groups of six. So some final considerations uh, that uh, we, I, so we, uh, me with Alessandra, uh, find that uh, it's very important uh, that the teachers at the university get some support from outside. So I'm an expert in maths, but uh, what do I, I know about uh, the pedagogic of uh, teaching? It's only experience, of course. So I think training sessions uh, prepare it, uh, can be prepared for teachers to prepare both the design, the production of the MOOCs, and also how to apply MOOCs on campus and at the same time being a tutor with, uh, for the outsider participants. So thank you very much. It's, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? No question. One or both? I can, I can walk a bit. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon. My name is Martijn Stellingwerf. Uh, I'm from TU Delft, uh, Faculty of Architecture. And actually, I'm uh, a teacher. Uh, so um, I'm also working together with Johanetta and Michael, who you saw in the previous slide. I did the Peche Kucha format, so it's going on each 12, 20 seconds. Um, so, you know this acronym OAR, but augmented reality can be put on top of that. Um, the normal paradigm now is that people look at this constantly, and this will change in the next uh, decade, because then uh, the, the phone will get on our eyes. And uh, augmented reality is really something where your content that you share in open ways is everywhere around. So AR is very contextual and um, also behavioral. I found this image from uh, Delft and actually it, it matches my view from my attic. And uh, this was already a kind of fictional addition to the normal view, because that's the fantasy of the painter. And this was done uh, this weekend. Um, last Friday, Elon Musk presented a new truck, the Cybertruck. On Saturday, someone uh, modeled uh, a 3D model uh, of this, 
uh, he or she uh, shared it on uh, Sketchfab, and I used it in AR uh, in the center of uh, Milan. Um, I use uh, software that integrates all the attribution directly, so uh, you drag and drop, like in uh, PowerPoint, your assets, the 3D things, you place them in the world around you, and immediately uh, a list of credits is generated from the software. Um, so for, with our students, we use this as a presentation means, but also uh, collaboration and prototyping, and I use it to, uh, to explain things in my lessons, of course. Um, this started with uh, using Sketchfab, which is a big digital uh, repository uh, for 3D content. Um, but of course, in history, we had uh, Hortus Botanicus for plants, Pinacotheque or Kleptotheque for sculpture and art, libraries for books, and at Delft we have a, a nice uh, chair exhibition. And in the coming years, these things will become more digitally available. Um, with a group of uh, history thesis students, I will be studying chairs, and um, they all are asked to make uh, an AR experience from it. So I prepared one myself to, um, to explain how this was done. This is a chair I got from my parents. Uh, it's from the 50s. I scanned it. I distributed the parts on uh, Sketchfab. So they are open, available. And then um, in, in an, oh, no, this is the, the Sketchfab site. You can find a lot of content there in all kinds of uh, license types. So it's not all open, usable, it's also paid content. But uh, yeah, when you download it, it is already in a shared type of uh, attribution. Um, and then you can use these assets in an augmented reality environment or other experiences. So we used it to explain the history of this chair with reference images from the, the, the 60s and the 50s. And we made a kind of animation how this African chair, which slides in in two parts, uh, is really working. Um, what is this about? Yeah, also this uh, Sketchfab repository, we use it in, in uh, my edX course. And um, we ask students to also develop uh, 3D content by using photogrammetry. So that's an easy way, well, relatively easy way to make 3D impressions. Um, we integrated that in an edX MOOC. And um, when the students post their content on uh, Sketchfab, they have to use a hashtag, so I can find all their work using the tag Spatial uh, 101X. And uh, they can also see each other's work in that way. And I can download it and uh, look from all sides. Uh, it's a kind of YouTube for 3D. Um, I also used their work in my feedback videos. So we have a, a, a green screen studio in Delft, and I used that with uh, VR, VR goggles, and I could show their work as if I was standing in between the scale models. I could also scale it up, scale it down, change it, and so on. And this was the, a more recent version. It was in augmented reality in our uh, yellow teaching lab. I think you remember it. Um, and you could, could just turn as if their work was there. And I think that gives a real uh, sensibility of uh, the recognition from the students as well. 
Uh, I found an, a totally different example from the University of Darm Darmstadt. They uh, are concerned with uh, uh, insects and um, they made a, an open source scanner to use these little insects and look at them and make them in 3D. Then they distributed again on Sketchfab and people can uh, explore these uh, animals and um, in, that's their way to make people aware that the less in insects are there and that they are a bit harmed by our environment. So um, that's what I think about that, that new acronym and I hope you, uh, you might be interested to also adopt some of such uh, techniques in your own education. Thank you. Thank you. I was just wondering what the uh, learning curve is like for students. If uh, It sounds like perhaps these students have a technical background to begin with, but do you encounter a lot of variety in some students that need a lot of work and effort to get up to the point to be able to do this? Actually, it's, it's a big uh, threshold for them to, to make 3D content. Um, in my MOOC, uh, Models in Architecture, I decided to use photogrammetry so in week one, they develop a scale model, a very rough sketch. They take a hundred pictures around it, and uh, through a cloud surface, it's made in 3D. And, well, a uh, hundred students succeeded. Uh, I showed you some of them. Um, but I'm aware it's still a burden. Thank you. Uh, oh, another question. Yeah. I think that stuff is really interesting, and I do. I'm really fascinated by where this stuff will go. Um, I saw last January there was a group at Penn State who was playing with glitch, and they were actually taking a, um, basically what was essentially learning HTML, but you would be learning HTML to build 3D objects, and then you could host those objects in that environment. Is that stuff you've played with, or anything you've kind of imagined about actually, because it does get to it be more accessible to students, because like learning HTML, you could learn a language that would allow you to build a 3D environment on the web. So, yeah, yeah that, any, that's a really good point. Uh, also, the format in which the, the content comes should not be proprietary. So, uh, for example, Apple now has a beautiful 3D format that is shared, and, uh, but, but it's still proprietary. It's not for Android use and so on. Um, but a good uh, development there is uh, Web AR, which is open in the... Uh, like HTML. So, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for, for your talk. How much is openness a thing among the AR folks? <laughs> Are um, you the only one, or is it mainstream? Well, normally uh, it, it's. Um, authored in, in laptop or, or computer sto software for gaming, like um, um, Unity and Unreal Engine. And they have certain open source and, uh, and closed source work. Um, I use uh, an, uh, an app from uh, Portland. Uh, it's called Torch. And um, they really integrate this uh, licensing, like I showed, 
that uh, everything you drag in will be noted and you can generate a list of uh, the, the licenses from that. I don't know exactly how this will continue in the workflow, but it's uh, a start. Um, okay, thank you very much. Buonasera. Hi, my name is Lisa Young, and I am from Scottsdale, Arizona, um, in, um, right near the Phoenix area, about three hours away from the Grand Canyon. I serve at Scottsdale Community College as the faculty director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. And, oh, it was not supposed to do that. Hold on. Excuse me. All right, we're back. Um, I serve as the faculty director of our Center for Teaching and Learning, so I work with our faculty on helping them teach, and I am one of the founding members of the Maricopa Millions Open Educational Resources Pro Project. Also, I am originally from Rhode Island, so sometimes I talk with an accent, and that sometimes happens, so you know. So I wanted to tell you about a student. This student is a digital native, someone who has been using computers since the age of six. This student has a Bachelor's of Science, a Master's of Education, and a PhD. This student started learning online in 1996, and this student started um, teaching in 1997 online and earned an online PhD in 2009. This student is also an instructional designer, an instructional technology, te technologist, an early adopter always wanting to try something new, and a first generation Kindle owner, and all the other Kindles after the first generation, as well as a first generation iPhone owner, and all the generations after early adopter, technology geek, this student. So in 2018, this student started an online program. Their last online program was 2009. The content was delivered through ebooks, open educational resources, e-journals, videos, some were copywritten, some were open, and that student was me. That's me um, in primary elementary school with my mom at Wyman Elementary. And uh, I've always been a lifelong learner. I've always pushed myself really hard to earn honor roll 4.0, except for that freshman year in my undergraduate degree. Um, and I've always wanted to learn. So last year, I had this amazing opportunity um, that I had a great opportunity to have a sabbatical. So I had a year where I didn't work, I still earned a salary, and I got to go to school. I earned a graduate certificate in advanced data analytics for higher education, because I thought it would be fun, and it was. But I was really challenged with learning in this environment. I, even though I had all of this online experience, I had an opportunity to be one of the first online learners in 1996. I was the first person to teach online in 1997 before there were even learning management systems. I used something called web course in a box. So like there, before Blackboard. And I had an opportunity, so I was, I was teaching faculty how to teach online. But when I was faced, with all of these different materials, I really struggled. It was a little different than how I was used to learning. So I'm going to switch gears for a minute here. Right now, our students, 70% of our students do not have the textbook on the first day. As a faculty member who has been teaching for 26 years, 
I find it so difficult to prepare to have great engaging interactions with my students when they don't come prepared to class. And if they don't have the textbook, they're not coming prepared to class. 50% of our students who delay that purchase are expecting to see their grades suffer. Can you imagine that? They know they're going to see their grades suffer. We heard from Trudy this morning that she had to choose whether to get her glasses or her textbooks. Our students have to, as in the US, have to make choices. Do they eat? Do they have textbooks? Do the, or do they have glasses? These are really challenging decisions that our students have to make. And as an instructor, I'm perplexed as to how to help my students learn. So we're thrilled to have open education resources. We just, I just learned last month at the Open Ed 19 conference held in Glendale, Arizona, that 22% of the students that we provide OER to on the very first day of class or even beforehand don't open the textbook on the first week. Now we're doing a lot of important work. We're providing great resources, they're not accessing them. To me, that's a problem. So now, our students have access to OER materials. Many are di digital. I ask you, why aren't we moving the needle? Why aren't our students doing better in regard to student success? Why are they not accessing those materials right away? Why aren't their grades being significantly impacted? We see that we do no harm with the students having open educational resources. But honestly, if our students have access to the material on the first day and they don't have to choose between their glasses or their textbooks, I believe our students should be doing better. I find it frustrating that we're, we're providing this to our students, but our students aren't doing better. And I have an idea of maybe why this may be the case. Wrong. So what could it be? It's a lot of things. Um, motivation, generations, all sorts of things. But I want you to think about it for a minute. What could it be? Or 20 seconds. So part of my student confession is that I had access to all of these materials. I have the funds to find any textbooks. I have the ability to have, to use materials. I know how to learn. I know, I thought I knew how to learn online, but I didn't even think about using the control F feature to search my open textbooks. I went to the glossary because I'm old and there was no glossary in this particular open education textbook because you can control F and find it. There were all these wonderful videos, but I am challenged with videos. I, I, I have my students do videos for me for class, but they have to be three minutes long because I can't stay engaged with videos. To me, watching a video is a passive entertainment. It's not about spend, you know, being actively engaged in it as passive. I sit on the couch, I watch a video. So now to learn from these videos, I was really challenged. How do I learn from them? Where do I take notes? Do I put the time of where I wanted to access it? What, did I, what do I do with it? And so I found it to be really challenging. Not only that, I said I was a first generation Kindle owner, right? I take notes in my Kindle all the time I don't know how to access my notes in my Kindle. Do any of you know how to access your notes in your Kindle? Oh, out of the room, I see only two hands. Do any of you take notes in your Kindle and highlight other than me that don't know how to do it? No. That says something. So if we're having our students use Kindles and different devices, how do we get them to take notes and know how to use them? I certainly didn't know, and I've been using them forever. Literally, since they've been out. So, I wanted to share some information that I learned at that Open Ed 19 conference in Glendale, Arizona. There was a student panel, and the students ranged in age from about 18 to maybe about 60. And the students had a lot of information to share. 
they shared that in regard to print materials, if print materials are required, they want to be able to purchase them at a low cost. So I was thinking, oh, they would print them all themselves. But no, they want to be able to, to buy them. That was shocking to me. I just figured they'd want to access them all um, online or be able to print them themselves what they needed. But they wanted to be able to buy them bound and in the bookstore. Um, many of those, our students don't own printers. Their parents don't own printers. They don't need them anymore. And they're willing to purchase those materials when they're available, much over printing them. In regard to online written materials, um, e-books, et cetera, students really want it to be indexed. They want to be able to control F and find them. They don't want it to be where they can't search it, don't scan it. Of course, it has to be accessible. Um, they really prefer having the functionality of being able to search and cut and paste um, and copy their materials as opposed to being able to have a print copy. Um, they really prefer that. Additionally, one of the things I'm wondering is, are students actually reading the materials we're providing to them? Or are they simply searching them? When I give a student a chapter to read, I'm expecting them to read the whole thing. But I wonder, are students doing that, or are they just searching for the answers? Some further research needs to be done there. So let's talk about note taking. I struggled with how to take notes from all of these electronic resources. It was a huge challenge, whether it was an ebook, whether it was OER, whether it was videos. And so I had to create my own version of how to take these notes. So one of the things I'd really like to see us do as a community, and this is my call to action if anyone would like to work with me, is that students, I would believe, don't necessarily know how to take notes, at least in the United States, have not learned how to take notes through e-resources, um, through our OER. They, we haven't learned how to take notes from video. They haven't learned how to take notes from any books that are electronically published. They're doing the best they can. They're copying and pasting. They're searching. They're doing all of this different work to try to find a methodology to take notes. Not only that, in looking and searching for any resources in regard to e-note taking, I, couldn't, I found very little. There are virtually no resources in this area. If you would like to work with me and develop some kind of open educational resource for our students on how to use OER resources in terms of note taking and really learning from them in depthly and move that needle in regard to student success, I would love for you to join me. That's my Twitter handle and my email address, and we can work together. Thank you. Uh, you are uh, one of the very few uh, who have uh, experienced this evolution uh, for 20 years, and I appreciate that. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Just an open uh, ph physiological, uh, um, philosophical question. How do you see uh, the situation after 20 years from now? I think that things will change very much. I think that um, I think that someone will come up with some kind of framework and tools to really help our students take notes. I think that um, our students are learning so much more through video. I mean, that's a passive activity for me. It's not for our newer students. Um, so I, but I think that we're still lacking a tool and a methodology and framework for our students to take notes. That will exist. Um, I think many of them will exist. And I think that these challenges won't be the case. Um, I hope that our students, that we're moving the needle by then, and that our students are able to have better success and not just no harm. So 
So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Jean Amaral, and I'm the Associate Professor and Open Knowledge Librarian at Borough of Manhattan Community College, which is part of the City University of New York. Hi, I'm Gina Cherry. I'm the director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching, Learning, and Scholarship, also where Jean is. And Gina and I actually co-lead both our OER, ZTC, and our open pedagogy programs. So we're going to talk to you about our move from OER to open pedagogy and cultivating a culture of open. Um, so in thinking about this, um, to give context, the open culture um, grows within a con context of an open ecosystem. Um, and we envision the open ecosystem this way including a number of different elements. Um, OER courses, which in our case are OER zero textbook cost courses. We use both OER and no cost materials with our faculty. Um, and obviously this draws on the five R's um, as well as using that no cost material. And we work with faculty to redesign their courses. There's, oh, you wanna go? <laughs> There's also um, OER-enabled pedagogy. Many, probably many of you are aware of this. Again, going back to the five R's, students and faculty working, um, curating, um, creating, and um, using OER within the course um, as well. And uh, we also include open pedagogy in this ecosystem. In our case, there are many definitions that I'm sure you're aware. I just came from another open pedagogy session where they talked about um, access and agency being key to open pedagogy, and we would certainly agree with that. We also focus really strongly in our open pedagogy program on students creating knowledge, students as knowledge creators rather than just as knowledge consumers. Consumers. Um, for open educational practices, we're envisioning openness enacted within all aspects of instructional practice, including the design of learning outcomes, the selection of teaching resources, and planning activities and assessments. So students are co-creating the entire course um, with the faculty. And then open teaching, this is faculty publicly sharing their teaching. Sometimes that's face-to-face, -face, inviting colleagues into their classroom, or sometimes it's on the web where their whole course is available to anybody in the world, and you can go to the web to find that course. Um, and so the open teaching part of it can happen both online and face-to-face. -face. So what does this look like? Um, we think about this as a process, not a product. And so it involves a number of shifts. Um, Thank you. Um, so one of those shifts is from a closed environment to an open environment. So that might mean moving from teaching and learning in a closed uh, platform like Blackboard or Canvas to teaching and learning on an open platform like a WordPress-based platform. It also might mean moving from close to open in a face-to-face -face context. So uh, faculty opening their classrooms up to colleagues or students going out into the real world and, and doing assignments out in a public space. Um, it's also moving from closed choices to open choices, um, so that transparency with students. And this can mean um, statements or explanations on a syllabus, um, starting with explaining why a faculty member is actually using OER um, in the course, rather than commercial materials. Um, it's explaining assignment choices, um, being very transparent about the learning outcomes and what students, um, they're hopeful that students students will get from those. Um, it's also about reflecting about their own choices. So we had a faculty member who has a blog that's available um, right now where she reflected on every decision she made about her course and then she had her students read that which was eye-opening for those students to understand the thought process of a faculty member. And then they reflected on her um, reflections as well as part of the course. Um, Oh, I'm doing this one. <laughs> um, this is also about moving from teacher-centered to student-centered to learner-driven. We really want to get into that learner-driven space, a space of um, uh, offering students that agency, having them be able to um, accept that agency in their own education. Um, and so certainly um, in this space, uh, you can imagine students setting the class norms. Um, do we allow phones in class? How are we going to behave with each other? What is this class going to be about? So rather than the, the faculty members setting those norms, we have the students create those norms um, together. Um, and uh, the students choosing reading, so co-creating the syllabus. So don't go in with a syllabus all set. Actually work with students to co-create that syllabus, choose the readings, choose the assignments. We had an instructor who had a choose your own assignment um, and actually many choices in it. 
And then finally, a shift from knowledge consumers to knowledge creators. So as Jean said, our focus really is on students as knowledge creators, but also faculty. So rather than consuming commercially available course materials, uh, faculty create knowledge and share it publicly through OERs. And so we're going to talk about what this um, looks like or how we engage with this at BMCC. So we want to just briefly give you some context um, that we are the largest college in the City University of New York system, CUNY. We have 27,000 students, 500 full-time faculty, 1,000 part-time, and we are a majority minority institution in terms of our students. So we want to talk about our faculty development program, which has been going on since 2015. Um, and it has three main aspects. So the first part is the OER ZTC course redesign program that Jean started before I got to BMCC. Um, that is a two-day workshop for faculty who are interested in incorporating OER materials in their classes. And we do spend some time on practical topics like copyright and creative commons, but really the focus of those workshops is on pedagogy and specifically on backwards design and culturally sustaining pedagogy. So it's a chance for faculty to completely rethink their courses and, and they find that really inspiring. Um, in 2018, we started the Open Pedagogy Seminar for faculty who had already been through the OER ZTC uh, course redesign. And that's also a two-day workshop and it's designed um, so that we model open pedagogy as part of the workshop. Um, the first day is really focused on pedagogy, and the second day on platforms, um, specifically the, uh, two WordPress-based platforms that you can hear more about on Thursday. Um, so we also um, work with faculty to scale these programs, and we have an OERZ degree, um, and we're focusing on a few more of those. Those are very thin pathways, though, so we also have a program that involves course hub development, where a faculty member designs an entire OER course, puts it on a WordPress site. It's now available for any other faculty member who teaches that course to adopt it straight out of the box and make it their own um, by making any changes they would want at that point. But it, gets, it, it lowers the barrier to entry for faculty who aren't able to take the workshops. And um, we do um, not only support OER and open pedagogy, but we support platforms um, at CUNY, um, including Academic uh, Commons, which is publicly available, um, BMCC Open Lab, Manifold, and then the other two are products that are not ours. We are presenting at 2.15 on Thursday about these platforms, so we encourage you to come. And then we have a, a new, a relatively new event called Open Teaching Week. That's a week-long event every spring. It brings it all together, celebrates our culture of open, and it's centered around this idea of open classrooms um, so faculty can get ideas, new ideas for their teaching by visiting each other's classes, both online and face-to-face. -face. And then in addition, we have a number of other events on various topics related to open OER and open pedagogy. And we wanted to let you know about the partners that we work for in this. Um, on the, uh, I forget what side that is, the library seedles and e-learning. <laughs> um, those are folks who work with us in this faculty development arena. So I'm from the library, Gina is from Seedles. Um, and um, we also have e-learning um, who work with us. And on the other side, um, we have um, folks who give us funding, academic affairs and the CUNY system, as well as folks who give us data. So in terms of researching how successful these programs are, we work with our institutional research for data on our students and faculty. I know this. Uh, yeah, we can skip that one. And we're gonna leave up this slide right here that talks about um, our faculty and how they've responded. Um, the most important thing about the program um, is that it is transformative and liberatory um, for both our students and our faculty, and you can see that in some of the quotes. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know if there's time for questions. Yes. Oh, there. So I'll take a stab and then you can jump in. Um, so we have been incredibly successful through word of mouth um, on the faculty side. So we focus really on faculty development. And because the program was always about transformation and liberation, I think it really spoke to the faculty. Um, that they, they knew our students are very low income, so they were certainly came in the door because it would save our students money. But when they left, it was about they, their minds and their classes were blown open and they shared that 
with other faculty who wanted to participate. So we've always had too many faculty signing up and we have to turn them away semester after semester. Um, on the student side, we are not doing as much outreach as, I, as we could, so I've seen a couple of things that have given me ideas about how to do that, um, to actually engage students in advocacy work to get more faculty on board, but yeah. Oh, what in the back? Yes, if you come to us, we will absolutely be able to share an open pedagogy website that we have as well as our OER website. So we actually engage with faculty in the open pedagogy workshop in the open, so anybody can go and see how that workshop worked and see how our faculty, the assignments that our faculty did, um, and how they engaged around open pedagogy in that. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you all. Let's